So we got this group started as a collaboration across the Atlantic between our two institutions, the Scott Polar Research Institute um, at Cambridge University, and where I'm based at Boston University at the Party, Frederick Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. So our two centers are joined together in this um, enterprise. Um, Michael and I have collaborated in the past on international um, Arctic themed events and projects. So we're just going to say a few things about what, what um, we hope to be able to create here in this forum with all of you and going forward before we introduce our speaker. Do you want to start us off, Michael? I want to share your excitement in welcoming everybody to uh, what we hope is a new conversation space um, for the role of the humanities, however you want to construe that. Um, around the theme of the Arctic. And uh, it comes not out of a call for research in the humanities, but a recognition of how much research uh, has taken place. And, um, and trying to think about how we use the virtues of um, the kinds of conversations that, that, that are unique to the Arctic um, to bring together a whole range of different uh, perspectives in the humanities. We're very uh, conscious, how could we not be, of the moment, uh, the multiple moments that we share, that we inhabit now, whether it's the COVID pandemic, the climate emergency, uh, or the Anthropocene. Uh, so there's also surely some uh, desire to make sense uh, of, the mo of the moment we find ourselves in. Um, for ourselves as researchers and the conversations that we're having about the region that we work in. Just as we were getting started, our speaker Dolly was mentioning or referring to the, the importance of creating a space for the humanities and, and however we distinguish that from the social sciences, not to the exclusion of the social sciences, but surely also not to the detriment of the humanities. So one of the things that I think we want to do going forward across a series of conversations is to think about the role of the uh, humanities um, with the idea of thinking about how the different areas of work come together and how we create a, a knowledge space, a conversation space for them. Um, and in a way, at the risk of being a little provocative, without resorting to what may be a, a more common knee-jerk reaction, which is to pitch so many uh, conversations and debates in the context of late 20th century language of risk, uh, which is fine in its own right, but often uh, can subvert um, a lot of other more complex work um, in the humanities. Adriana? Um, so to build on Michael's argument, uh, so we're looking to really broaden and deepen the kinds of temporal scales we use. So in terms of avoiding a narrowly presentist or futurist, thinking of the Arctic along lines of risk like Michael is laying out, we want to encourage people and to bring together different ways of looking at the Arctic um, that encourage longer historical frames, multidisciplinary historical frames. Um, not human-centric and not obviously Eurocentric, but to think outside of linear, um, future-oriented um, temporal frames in the Arctic, and to really highlight also the importance of different kinds of agencies in the Arctic. Um, so he, human agencies of diverse indigenous, non-indigenous peoples in the Arctic, but also non-human agencies as powerful forces and the Arctic itself is having an agency in all our lives. Um, and the special value of the Arctic as a place that makes possible a, a unique kind of convergence of ways of thinking and experiencing that we hope that we know of so many different people working on this that really we wanna help to kind of let that be visible, the uniqueness of the Arctic as a kind of method in itself. So our speaker today um, will briefly introduce, um, we are very lucky to have Dolly Jorgensen as our, as our um, 
our lead off speaker today. She is a historian of the environment and of technology at the University of Stavanger in Norway. She's written um, extensively on the history of an um, STS, history of um, science, technology, um, and society, but also on animal studies and most recently on extinction studies. Um, her most recent book, and I have visual aids, is a wonderful book called um, Recovering Lost Species in the Modern Age, Histories of Longing and Belonging from MIT Press. It's an excellent book. Um, she's edited numerous books, including this one, Northscapes, which many of you will know. Northscapes, um, History, Technology, and the Making of Northern Environments, um, which she edited with Zverker Sorling, who will be our second speaker in the series. Um, she has an unusual breadth of uh, disciplinary expertise, as you may have heard a little bit in the conversation <laughs> that you guys are having in the morning, in, in the beginning. But I just want to highlight how unusual it is. I mean, to have its uh, this book, Recovering um, Lost Species, which I highly encourage you to read, um, is a wonderful example of someone working in STS and environmental history, but so. Um, elegantly nuanced on the importance of affect and emotion and culture. And that's unusual to see someone working quite so comfortably and creatively across those fields. Mm -hmm. well, I'd like to add, I suppose one of the ways uh, such inspiring work comes about is, I think in Dolly's own words, she says that she loves to look at uh, issues and problems from, from multiple perspectives. And I think that that's something that we see in her work. <clears throat> and uh, and that's something I hope we want to uh, welcome across the group. So one of the ways in which Dolly instantiates it, though she may not say so so very often, is that she brings together actually a, a very substantial background in engineering, I believe, as well as history. And we sometimes tend to think, oh, you must be one thing or another. In our institute, we're often associated with either natural scientists or social scientists, but the world's far more interesting when we stop being uh, categorized in these simplistic silos. So I think uh, Dolly epitomizes that in the most interesting and productive ways. Um, it's also fortunate for us that she has uh, an incredible uh, work ethic <laughs> and as uh, so productive. So many of you will know her for having been uh, president of the European Society for Environmental uh, history from 2013 to 2017, as well as being uh, the editor, co-editor of the journal Environmental Humanities, which is very much to the point today, and many other things besides. But that gives you a little bit of the flavor um, of the speaker that we have with us today. So without further ado, we'll invite Dolly Jorgensen to give us her talk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here as I was uh, speaking with Michael uh, beforehand. It's always interesting um, for me to hear how other people think about uh, my work since it is so diverse, uh, covering lots of time frames and lots of issues. Um, but, I, you know, at, at base, it's always about um, our relationship with the environment. And what does that mean historically? So I've, I'm, you know, a historian at, at base, um, but yet I want to bring in other kinds of sources, um, you know, literature and arts and emotions and things that, it, that many environmental historians sometimes, you know, you may shy away from because they're not quite archival sources. Um, so, it, it's always interesting to, to hear and I, and I embrace it. I, I, I want a variety of things um, to, to inform my work. So the paper that I'm going to talk about today and that I'll share with you um, is something that grew out of the book or I, I discovered it all while I was writing that book, but it's not in the book. Um, and this is because the in the book, I have a chapter on muskox. Um, which is about the idea of rewilding muskox, so re releasing muskox into, into the wild to make Norway a wilder place. Um, and, and the reasonings people had behind that and the emotional uh, attachments that they had to muskox as, as hopeful animals 
And at the same time, those people who feared the muskox and, and what it would do. Um, so that's the chapter in the book. What I'm going to talk about today is another side of the story, a flip side of the story, which is about agriculture and the muskox. So I'll share now uh, my presentation because I have some nice pictures and even some videos. Um, and so we'll do that. So hopefully everybody sees it there. I hope so. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm calling this the shaggy savior of Northern Norway and you'll see um, why, because I'm looking at the idea um, of the North trying to make it economically and ecologically productive uh, through the import of musk oxen as a domestic animal in Norway. So their potential role um, to create an economic boon in the northern part of Norway was seen as the next big thing um, in the 1960s and 70s. So we're going to see how boosters publicly praised plans to turn muskox into a native resource. Um, I'll give you a little uh, foreshadowing. None of those schemes are successful. So uh, we can look at them as a repeated failure, a failure project, and that can teach us something, right? We shouldn't always just look at successes um, if we want to know what people really think and do. So this is the animal that I'm uh, talking about, the musk ox. Um, it's probably the worst named animal on the planet because it has neither musk nor is it an ox. Um, it's a ruminant in the family of sheep and goats. Uh, but as you can see, it does have rather thick and prominent horns, um, which, and it will charge people. So it's led to its association with oxen. And it does have a really strong smell, which is why the early explorers associated it with musk, which actually comes from musk deer. So they live in the Arctic and subarctic, and some of you may have seen them uh, before, seen them live out in the tundra, eating their grasses and lichens and moss and other plants. They're generally sedentary during the winter to conserve energy, um, but in the summer they can roam uh, pretty widely. The musk ox has a highly prized coat of wool called kiviet. It's warmer than sheep's wool, finer than cashmere, hypoallergenic, and it doesn't shrink. It's the perfect wool. And in 1919, a Canadian Royal Commission was asked to investigate the possibilities of reindeer and musk ox domestication in Canada. And in that uh, evaluation, they determined that, um, yes, that musk ox would be a good candidate, but not really for the wool because of the lack of machinery available to process the fibers in 1919. That didn't stop Wilhelmer Stefansson, who many of you will know, um, in the northward course of empire in 1922, that musk ox was an ideal candidate for, quote, the first large scale effort of civilized man to enrich the world with a new domestic animal. So he believed that musk oxen would be easily domesticated within a generation. And he promoted then that domestication in an article in Harper's Magazine um, in 1946. The person he was, who picked this up in Vermont was John Teal Jr., a geographer and Arctic ecologist, somebody who went over some lines there uh, in disciplinary basis. Um, who started a farm in Vermont with musk oxen. He captured some musk ox calves in, in Canada, relocated them to his farm, and his vision was that the animal would be, quote, useful not only for Arctic husbandry, but also for the many sub-marginal farming areas in our northern states. He actually moved his domestication attempt to where we see here in the photos, Alaska, in 1964. 
Um, there were some problems with animals in Vermont um, from an ecological standpoint. They weren't really having very many calves. They didn't last very long. So he wanted to move them to their more natural habitat, as he called it, in the northern tundra. So they were moved on to a farm um, owned by the University of Alaska Fairbanks. In 1969, he set up the Umimak Muskox Producers Cooperative. And that's actually the word for muskox in uh, uh, Inuit, um, to knit kibiat. So his idea was that these muskoxen would um, be, the wool from them would be collected and would be knitted. So his original vision was for Native Alaskans to be active in a cottage knitting industry built from villages who would have individual herds. But that never happened. It stayed with the herd at the university farm. Um, you can actually visit that farm, or you could. I don't know now with COVID. But um, uh, my mother's actually visited that farm. Uh, in you know, about 10 years ago, they had two bulls, 21 cows, some steers, and a few calves, you know, for that year. And they gave about 100 pounds of kibiat for spinning. So this context matters in the 1960s then, because of what happens across the globe uh, in Norway, because there were similar dreams of farmers raising muskox musk oxen in the 1960s. So northern Norway as a region was struggling with emigration at that time, so people leaving northern Norway. The Norwegian government was concerned about depopulation, unemployment, and the lack of economic products from the area because it had historically depended upon uh, fishing and hunting. Almost all of the farming land in northern Norway was used as pasture land primarily dairy cattle. So there's actually lots of dairy cows in Northern Norway. Um, but the idea was, could they do something else uh, with those family farms than dairy cattle? So there was a proposal to bring muskox to Northern Norway as a domestic wool producer. It was raised in 1967 by the parliamentary representative, Alfred Henningsen. He um, arranged exchange visits with the muskox farms that Teal ran in order to bring support for the project and to find out some about muskox. In 1969, he officially asked the Department of Agriculture to support domestication of muskox in Norway. The state declined to do so. The reason is that the Norwegian Department of Agriculture had sent a uh, veterinarian, Magne Sanbu, to Alaska to investigate Teal's operation. And Sanbu's report cited potential health concerns, including potentially increased parasite loads because of milder climate in northern Norway than Alaska. Always interesting to realize that. As well as the intense management and close quarters that the animals are kept in. There's constant work at calming the animals, they need to have their horns removed, uh, wool collected, and controlled breeding. So Sambu concluded that with the right controls, risk to people and other animals would be minimized, but he didn't believe that wool production from farmed muskox would, quote, give a reasonable way of life for folk in Nord Norge. In spite of this lack of direct support, Henningsen founded a company called Norsk Muskus, so Norwegian muskox, in late summer 1969. And the company brought 25 muskox calves to northern Norway via boat from Greenland. And there's going to come a uh, things when you need to know, know it. When, so.
so the herd was established and hopefully everybody can hear me again i hope uh yes um established at a farm in bardu with the hope that eventually every farm in the area would have two to three musk ox for a meaningful supplementary income So the musk ox at Bardu held great promise, according to Noshk Mosus, through the luxury markets. So in February 1970, the company showed the musk ox wool dress that you see there on the screen, as well as actually two live musk ox, at the big agricultural fair in Oslo. The dress was, quote, as light as a snowflake and warm, but amazingly expensive. Um, it was expected to fetch a price of over $1,000 in 1970. 14 kilos of wool was plucked in 1970 from the animals and was sent to a ha local handicraft association to run a design competition. And in December 1970, Norsk Moskos advertised a gift that might just turn heads, an original Norwegian muskox pattern sweater designed by Miss Henningsen. Because muskox wool cost 70 kroner per kilo and took one month to hand spin, only the muskox themselves on the sweater uh, would be out of kiviet. The rest was actually regular sheep's wool. I just have to have to show that. Um, but in spite of um, attempts to build the hype up around uh, Kibiet's financial backing was pretty slow to come in. Um, they had denied an application for a loan. Uh, they were getting some supplementary income from visitors. Uh, so they opened it as a, a farm you could come and, and visit for a ticket fee. Uh, so that the income from the visits was around 22,000 kroner uh, in 1970. Um, they had 15,000 tourists by 1973. So Henningsen continued to show great optimism uh, for muskox as livestock, despite several more rejections uh, for funding. And he said this, now the Prime Minister Bratili must show that the government's Nord Norge plan is something more than just silos and fertilizer. Muskox is also Nord Norge's plan. The muskox farm has shown that the keeping of muskox has a future. We've been able to birth calves, we've been able to get a few animals out in open pasture and later get them home again. We've explored the possibilities for the uses of muskox wool. And we've shown that it's possible to get significant income from tourism in connection with a muskox farm. The consultant reports on the pos possibilities for marketing of muskox products are also very positive. However, the farm was struggling against the unruly nature of muskoxen as well as local residents who never particularly liked the farm and broke the fences several times. The wool business never proved solvent. The herd battled parasitic infections, and some, like the little calf penny shown here, died. Several times, groups of musk oxen got out of the enclosures and had to be hunted down. So, after struggling for financial survival for six years, the company shut down in 1980. Well, they shut down and then in 1980, they gave their remaining 10 animals to the University of Tromsø for Arctic animal research. Those animals relocated to the island of Riaia, where they lived until, nine, until 2018, the very last of the musk oxen in, uh, that the University of Tromsø owned on the island uh, was taken down because it's the other pair, the other of the pair had died the previous year. 
so it was all by itself um, and they didn't want to leave it. So um, that experiment gathered actually huge amounts of data and many natural scientists have published about muskox based on that herd. But they were let run free around the island rather than being as a domestic uh, wool producer. So there was a dream, a dream that was that you would have these kind of free range grazers, these animals that would go like sheep to different pastures and they would provide wool. It would be high income for the northern Norwegian farmers that were struggling. In reality, it was expensive um, to feed muskox in a farm setting. Um, there were all kinds of free range conflicts because you couldn't just let muskox go out. And as I, I talk about in, in the book, in the chapter there, um, in the 1960s, a man in Dovra was killed by a muskox. So people knew about this when muskox uh, roam around free. So that was not actually going to work. Muskox are not actually an easy animal to handle. As I mentioned in Alaska, they would dehorn them. They did not dehorn them because de dehorning is considered inappropriate. Um, they did not dehorn them in uh, Norway, uh, which meant they were actually quite difficult to, if you want to control them. Um, and you had no kibiot handicraft or particular equipment, so what to do and how to handle this material that while a great wool actually requires specialized uh, processing because of the fiber length and the, the quality of the fiber. So we can think about a couple of conclusions then to this story. So there was an idea that, well, if you have better resources, you bring in this brand new shiny thing, it's gonna save society. Um, and that you look to supplement or improve nature. So what naturally was in Northern Norway could be uh, bettered through this animal. But inevitably that's more difficult than what you expect. But what it also shows us is we need to remember that the North is an agricultural space. It is a space in which livestock are regularly raised. And the one that we tend to think of as reindeer. So I think here of, of Bathsheba de Muth's work, um, both in her new book and the, the chapter she has in Northscapes about reindeer and, and the way we can think of those as political objects and ecological objects together. But it's also agricultural space for, for small hold farming. Um, for potatoes, for cows, for sheep, and in fact, they tried for muskox. Um, and, and we need to, I think, one of the calls in, in Arctic um, environmental humanities and, and Arctic his, history work needs to be to actually take seriously um, the agricultural products that come out of the North. Um, that while we tend to think it's all ice, it's actually not. It has a very productive, albeit short, uh, growing season. And so to close off, I wanna end um, with a poem because, you know, humanity. Uh, Marian Moore wrote a poem called The Arctic Ox or Goat uh, in 1959. She was inspired by an article that appeared in Atlantic Monthly in March 1958 uh, that had been written by John Teal called Golden Fleece of the Arctic. And this is the poem that she wrote. So to wear the Arctic fox, you have to kill it. Wear Kiviet, the underwool of the Arctic ox, pull it off like a sweater. Your coat's warm, your conscience better. I would like a suit of Kiviet so light, I did not know I had it on. And in the course of time, another since I had not had to murder the goat that grew the fleece that made the first. The musk ox has no musk and it is not an ox, illiterate epitaph. Bury your nose in one when wet. If you fear that you're reading an advertisement, you are. If we can't be cordial to these creatures fleece, I think that we deserve to freeze. Thank you very much.